So today we are going to be talking about my top 10 fantasy novels or series. I don't make a distinction between a single standalone book or a single book in a series or a whole series. Those will be mixed and matched sort of in this list. I want to get to it fairly quickly, but let me uh, give a couple of caveats here. Uh, some books that aren't going to be mentioned, but are worth discussing when you're going to talk about some of your favorites. First, I am not going to be mentioning books that are really kind of nostalgia picks for me, a uh, series that I can't help but love. But really, that's because of how formative they were for me as a kid. Those two would be The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, which had a very prominent space on my childhood bookshelf. And then also Harry Potter. Um, Harry Potter was a big thing for me. Got into it because one of my cousins liked it. Uh, he was a little bit older than me. And then I started reading it. And then I had to keep reading those books. I would go to all of the release events. I stayed up all night to read the last book in a single sitting when it came out. And... I mean, the, the books were very important to me, but they're really more of a nostalgia thing. I, I look back at them very fondly, but they're not really in my top 10 now. And then there are three series that some people might expect to be on a list like this that aren't going to be anywhere close to the top 10 for me. And I figure it's worth talking about why. Uh, the first two are series that I just think are, are not very good. Uh, and I know they have big fan bases and followings, but these series really did not work for me. And those are The Witcher and The Kingkiller Chronicles. The Witcher, I just thought was very bland. I didn't find it very compelling. I also thought the TV show was very bland and didn't find it compelling either. And then the Kingkiller Chronicles, I really thought I would love because everyone told me it was like great prose, interesting magic system, good world building. And for some reason, it just fell flat. I found Rothfuss to be kind of an annoying writer. Um, I have no opinions about the man himself. I have never really you know, read about him or interacted with him or anything like this, but I just, was very annoyed the entire time I was reading. I don't know if I could rationalize how annoyed I felt, but I certainly felt it. And I just decided that this was not going to be a series that I would continue with. And then another series that won't be on the list, even though it is interesting and ambitious and impressive for that reason, is The Dark Tower by Stephen King. That series really sees King push himself in a lot of very interesting ways, in ways that I think are really impressive. But I also felt that that series was just stretched out so far and there were so many different weird ideas going on that never really got tied together properly. I love the gunslinger and the wolves of the Kala. So when King kind of leans into like the fantasy Western genre, I thought he was doing a great job, but I didn't even really like the last book in the series, which you would hope would be this great climax. I have mixed feelings about the ending, though mostly positive, probably. Uh, but there's just so much stuff in that series, kind of in the middle, that I really did not enjoy. But let's take a more positive turn and let's go through, starting at number 10, going to number one, my top 10 fantasy books. So number 10 is The Cosmere by Brandon Sanderson. I can already hear it sometimes. People are going to say that's a whole universe. It's not a whole series. But as we see in Mistborn Era 2 and a little bit of the Stormlight Archive, increasingly, the Cosmere is a connected story. It did not start that way, it seems. There was always going to be a shared background and lore, but increasingly events in one book seem to be having impacts on future books, and I think that's just going to grow. Now, some Cosmere books are much better than others. I like Warbreaker. I liked Elantris, actually. Um, I like Mistborn Era 2 a good bit, and I like probably the first two books of the Stormlight Archive um, quite a bit. I thought Rhythm of War is a little plotting. I actually don't like Sanderson's uh, representation of mental health all that much. I know that's what he's often lauded for. I think it always falls a little flat for me. And probably if I was going to ding Sanderson on any one thing, it's his, it's his prose. It's very, very simple. I think he said that he intentionally simplifies his prose in order to make his books more accessible. If so, that's fine. It's a choice. And I just don't like the choice. It just doesn't work for me. I also think sometimes leaning a little too much into the hard magic does take away from the kind of magical feeling of the story. And, and I think sometimes it feels less impressive because of that. I think in a book like Warbreaker actually, where the magic is explained, but you're really clear by the end of that book that you're dealing with, with creatures uh, or with entities that are much more powerful than any of the characters really imagined um, really does add that sense of mystery and fantasy back into the series. And that helps quite a bit. I also think maybe Sanderson would benefit from slowing down. I know one of the reasons his fans love him is that he puts out so many books, but I think that because he puts out so many books, he's not giving himself time 
to write a great book anymore. He's giving himself enough time to write a good enough book. And sometimes you want an author who can just supply you with a constant stream of good enough books, but I kind of wish he would take the time and really write that great book again. Number nine is His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman. I love the kind of alternate earth setting. Uh, it's a thing that just really works for me in a lot of fiction. Um, when I look at science fiction, I really love stuff like that. Uh, Neil Stevenson's Anathem is kind of a famous example, uh, and it's one of my favorite science fiction books. I think the plotting is very well done here. Pullman has kind of a slant on religion and how he wants to show it, but I like that he can so clearly state a kind of way of viewing the world and turn it into a whole plot and try to then tie it into much grander sort of cosmic measures. I think the ending of the last book is a little weak. I don't think it's as striking as maybe he was hoping for. The kind of big holy cosmic battle just doesn't actually work that well for me. But there are some parts uh, of, of his dark materials that are just truly great. The ending of the first book is, is gut-wrenching, so much so that when I was going to watch the HBO series, I had to quit because I realized I was just going to be emotionally wrecked by it because I knew what was coming. And that is a sign of really great writing, in my opinion, that I would be able to still connect so deeply with a moment that I hadn't read about in a very, very long time. Number eight on my list is Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin. If you have seen my science fiction videos, then it should be no surprise that Le Guin was going to make the list. Le Guin is one of my top three writers, and I love mostly her science fiction, but her fantasy is good too. And Earthsea is stellar. I love this kind of dreamlike atmosphere that she's able to get. Um, I find that when an author can do that well, I'm almost always going to love it. It's the same reason I love Gene Wolfe. Almost reads like a fairy tale, and for that, I think uh, it kind of invites you in, and it's a series that I would be totally happy to read to my son once he's old enough, and I think it'd be really beautiful. I, in fact, have the full illustrated edition of that book, and I would be very excited to share it with him. However, the themes of Earthsea are deep. They are mature in a way that I think is really great. Books that are, are written so that kids could enjoy them don't have to shy away from really hard themes. And, you know, in the first book, it's about knowing who you are is, is kind of a crucial part of the story. And as Ged has to kind of face his great enemy, it turns out that he needs to face himself. And, and that is a kind of philosophical theme. It's very deep, existentially, emotionally. And I love that Le Guin is writing these books so that kids can be introduced to this way of thinking about the world at a fairly young age. We're taking a quick break from that list to talk about today's sponsor, Gentle Bands. Gentle Bands is craftsmanship reimagined, making new and stylish rings for men. Gentle Bands also sent me a ring. This ring is made from the wood of a whiskey barrel and on the outside is titanium, which is lightweight and durable. This is great if you're looking for a wedding ring or some other ring and you want something that's going to be stylish and you want something that's gonna look classic but interesting. And in addition to selling cool rings, they offer sizing and engraving services. I'm kind of blown away actually by the range of options that you see on Gentle Bands. It really looks like for any guy who is looking for a ring, you are gonna find something that's gonna work for you and your style. So I would really encourage you to go check out that website. And if you find a ring that you'd like, and I'm pretty sure you will, you can use the code JARED25 to get 25% off. And if you wanna get there quicker, just use my link down below in the description. Number seven for me is a pick that I think most people would not include on a list like this, but I'm gonna say it's certainly fantasy, and that's Beowulf by, you know, the author of Beowulf. Beowulf is, of course, just an ancient epic poem and written in Old English, and it has this kind of savage nobility and ferocity to it, where Beowulf is a nobleman. He is striving for these kind of noble ideals to protect his home, to protect the home of those uh, whom he has come to love, to uh, right generational wrongs. And yet he's fierce, often battling demons or dragons with his hands. In fact, one of the things that happens over and over again is that Beowulf is like almost unable to use weapons as they're intended. Either an enemy cannot be struck by those weapons, or he is so strong that he uses them wrongly and actually damages the weapons when he tries to use them. The ending of Beowulf, where Beowulf goes to fight his final fight, 
and he is joined not by any of those, those men or those families that he has sought to protect and has sought to help prosper, but instead by just one young fighter is, is gut-wrenching and beautiful. Another series that I will talk about later and it's not really a spoiler because everyone knows it would be on here, is The Lord of the Rings. And The Lord of the Rings really sets the tone for so much fantasy. But because of Tolkien and other writers, but also just its impact on English prose, Beowulf really actually has set the standard or a lot of the themes and, and, and sort of the motifs of the fantasy genre. And for that reason, it has to be on a, on a list in my mind, even though most people would not add this to their list. Number six is a standalone book by Guy Gabriel Kay, and that's Tigana. I featured Tigana very early on this channel as a book with big ideas and great prose, and Kay's prose is probably his number one strength. But his other strength is his ability to create new worlds that are so deeply based on, let's call them non-traditional fantasy cultures. He is not basing them in that kind of milieu that, that Tolkien really establishes for the genre, because of that, it feels very fresh, but he's also so deep in the history of, say, Renaissance Italy or um, the Byzantine Empire that he can build these very lifelike and real worlds. It's like he's writing great historical fiction. He's changing enough of it to make it his own world, and he's adding those fantastical elements. Though the fantastical elements in N.K.'s work often are fairly toned down. They are not... They are not sometimes the biggest driver of the story. They're just kind of there. I love Tigana in particular because of its exploration of themes like cultural memory, cultural identity, cultural preservation, and the kind of tragedy of those who live in Tigana not even being able to speak the name of this place to everyone else. So e even the name of their home has been taken from them. I also love it though because it's a great standalone. So much fantasy is series-based, and that's fine. I like a good series. I'm, I'm reading Malazan right now, uh, which people have told me I love, and so far I'll say that I do like it, though I think it's funny that there's a character named Whiskey Jack. It's just a funny name, and I'm not quite sure what's going on, and yet I, and I'm enjoying it. But Malazan's like a big commitment, right? I'm gonna be reading it for a long time because there's so many books. But Tigana, it's thick, but it's not massive, and I can read it in a week, and I can feel good about it, and I'm gonna get a great story in an interesting world, and I'm not actually gonna feel like Kay is wasting space because he has to make a whole story with a whole world fit into, you know, 500 pages. Number five on my list is another standalone, and that's The Once and Future King by T.H. White. I am such a huge sucker for Arthurian legends. I, I love them so much. I love the various stories of King Arthur. I love the story of Lancelot. And then I, I love White's ability to translate uh, really Mallory's telling of Arthurian legends into a more modern idiom. He plays fast and loose with timelines and history and technology in ways that you end up just realizing make a better story for the reader. His telling of Lancelot and Guinevere is, is brilliant and brutal and heart-wrenching. And then Arthur's final moments going out to face his son, to face Mordred, knowing that he will die and knowing that the peace that he fought so hard to establish will not be preserved. It makes you tear up when you, when you read it and it's a great ending. There are also these beautiful interludes though, like when a young Arthur is being instructed by Merlin and he goes and learns how to live by living with ants or uh, living with uh, swans or geese. Uh, and he just learned so much about the world in these beautiful interludes that didn't need to be in the story, strictly speaking, but they tie in so well with the themes of the story that you can't help but love them. Number four on my list is a more modern book, and that's Piranesi by Susanna Clarke. I could have thought about putting Jonathan Strange and Mr. Nor Norell on this list because I really liked that book. Piranesi is so beautiful that I just keep coming back to it. I think at this point, I've probably talked about Piranesi two or three times on this channel because of how much I like it. Again, I like that, that play about memory. Memory is kind of a main character in Piranesi uh, in a really powerful way, but also this 
this house that you find in like this alternate world. It's mysterious, it's fae-like, and actually Clark's ability to kind of represent the fae, um, the magic as a, as a weird and dangerous place that we can't fully understand and we won't know all of its effects on us is um, really beautiful and, and really critical. Number three is a big series, and that is Discworld by Terry Pratchett. Most of the books that I have chosen here are often pretty serious. T.H. White's Once and Future King can be comedic sometimes, especially at the beginning, but it gets darker and more serious as it progresses. There are funny parts in the Cosmere, but frankly, I think Sanderson trying to write humor is where he's close to his weakest. But Discworld just is hilarious. All of it is funny. It can also be deeply serious, like Night Watch in the, the City Watch series is a really heart-wrenching book. It's not that funny, but I think actually comedians often have a real sense of the tragic and they know when to laugh, but also when to make you cry. Terry Pratchett is exploring this very, very well. I like that Discworld can evolve so much. Those early books are really kind of fantasy pastiche. I really like those early books, but by the time you get to um, Mort, the, the world has really changed. And even if you just read the City Watch books, you would see how technology has advanced or thematically things have changed. Just overall, you can see a world that is changing. And it's almost like Pratchett is, is realizing that the world he was born into has changed very quickly too. So of course his fantasy world has to change. The Librarian is a great recurring character. I love him. The Patrician, a great recurring character. Sam Vines, um, Carrot, all great characters. I love Death, though I don't like as many of the standalone Death books as much as other people do. One book that I think is terrific in the series that really gets overshadowed because it's kind of sandwiched in between other great books is Equal Rights, which is kind of a standalone or could be seen as the first witch's novel. Equal Rights showing a, a girl who wants to go and become a wizard instead of becoming a witch. Uh, it's, it's hilarious the entire time and I really do love it and I highly recommend it. Though I would say if someone wanted to get into Discworld, the best thing they could do is to get those City Watch books and start reading from there. All right, we are in our top two and number two is not gonna be a surprise to anybody except that it's number two. Maybe you think that this book should always be number one or this series should always be number one but it's number two for me, and that's The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. I even joked with someone that maybe I could not put this on my list, and I would be, you know, at least getting a lot of engagement because people would be very angry. And I, and I struggled with it, and I think originally I wasn't gonna put it on my list because I thought it was a cliche, but I think that by not putting it on my list because it was a cliche, I would actually be giving in to the wrong sort of peer pressure. I don't wanna be so original that I end up saying false things. And the truth is, if you are making a list of the best fantasy books, you have to recognize the place of the Lord of the Rings. J.R.R. Tolkien set the standard. As you will see, because this book is number two, he does not set a standard that no one else can meet. In fact, I think someone else has surpassed it, but he set the standard. The sheer force of his creativity, the sheer force of his imagination, his ability to construct languages and histories and mythologies and tie them in thematically even to our own world is astounding. The Hobbit was an early book for me and almost could be counted as one of those nostalgia reads that I that I wouldn't count as one of the, the top books. But The Lord of the Rings, I was able to read as an adult again and just see how great it was all, all over again. The Two Towers, admittedly is a little bit of a slog in the middle. Um, I think that's just like kind of a pacing thing, but that's also because Tolkien is writing at a slightly different time where we've just gotten used to much faster paced fantasy novels. And Tolkien is writing this a bit more like an epic or a bit more like a myth where there will be those slow thematic interludes or when you have a kind of break from the action, it can be actually quite a long break. All right, so number one is the Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson. This is fantasy at its best. This is great. I love The Wheel of Time so, so much. Um, we won't talk about the show, but I will just say the book series is terrific and it's amazing and I love it. It's hard for me not to just gush about how much I love these, these books. Yes, there is a bit um, in the kind of lat latter bit of the middle that's known as the slog, it does slow down a little bit. But even those books have terrific parts in them and all of it pays off as you go further and further in the series. The, the final book is astounding. Brandon Sanderson did a terrific job 
finishing what Jordan had started. I know that he did it in part because he could he could work with Harry McDougal, who was Robert Jordan's wife, and also that he could uh, look through Jordan's notes, and a lot of that was plotted and planned out. But you have to admire the skill, the, the ability to get something like that over the finish line. The Wheel of Time starts as, frankly, a kind of knockoff of the Fellowship of the Rings. There's a chosen one, they have to leave their kind of idyllic village, uh, and they have to go on a quest somewhere. It's very standard kind of fantasy. And those books just grow and grow and grow into something beautiful. When you read The, the Great Hunt, suddenly the world deeply changes. You read, then you read The Dragon Reborn and you see just how epic and grand in scope everything is going to be. And then you realize that you were wrong later because it's gonna be even bigger than that. The ability to integrate myth and history is astounding. No one has done it better. And I would say, that Robert Jordan's ability to create realistic cultures with their own histories that feel real and lived in and don't just feel like they exist to be plot devices is unmatched. Each of the cities have their own politics and they have a reason for existing, kind of a, an internal logic to the world. Foreign cultures, cultures that aren't kind of in the realm that the the main characters kind of understand as part of their own, all have their own reasons, they're interesting. And Robert Jordan just pulls it all together. It all just works so, so well. The Wheel of Time is, I think for me, gonna be unmatched fantasy. It would be really hard for me to find anything that supplants the Wheel of Time. Even if I come to like really love Malazan or something, the Wheel of Time just kind of has cemented itself as fantasy at its best. It's what I think fantasy should be. All right, I am sure that this list would generate a lot of thoughts. And so I would love to hear uh, from the rest of you what you thought or what your top 10 would be. So let me know down below.